Zombie Tech. <sighs> Welcome to Zombie Tech, a forum for engineers, scientists, and inventors to ponder on the technologies needed to survive the inevitable zombie apocalypse. She's Eddie. He's Whisker. And who do we have today? We have Dr. Hey. Bradley Wojtek. <laughs> uh, you're like considered to be one of the world's foremost neuroscientists on zombies. Uh, somehow that seems to be have become the case, yes. <laughs> Which is totally awesome. It definitely sounds like not the sort of thing you can do on purpose. <laughs> yeah, I don't think one can plan their career to make this happen. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how did it start? How did all the zombie brain analysis begin? Um, so I actually got a cold call one afternoon. Uh, last summer, so summer, I think it was like June of 2010, from Matt Moak, who's the head of the Zombie Research Society. Uh, and I was actually on vacation with my wife, and I got this phone call. And basically, Matt said that he had seen some presentation I had given uh, on YouTube about neuroscience. And at the very beginning of the talk that I would given, I mentioned how one of the reasons I got into studying neuroscience was because of growing up reading science fiction and comic books and stuff and thinking, wow, we could probably do some of that really cool shit uh, in real life now. Mm -hmm. And so he gave me a call and he said, hey, do you happen to be into zombies too? Um, and my wife and I, for years, have been joking with our friends about our zombie contingency plan up in uh, San Francisco. And uh, a friend of mine in uh, grad school, Tim Versteinen, who's uh, my zombie collaborator, uh, he and I used to watch zombie movies and you know we get together and hang out and sort of talk about what a zombie brain would look like and things like that so it, it ended up being uh, a really good fit yeah though when he first called i got off the phone with my with uh with matt and turned to my wife and i'm like this sounds kind of cool but i don't know if this guy's legit or what this sounds really strange yeah what do you think so uh it ended up being really good though awesome. Matt's awesome, by the way <laughs> say again matt's awesome by the way matt cool. moke matt you're awesome let it be known. Um, so you and Tim have, Dr. Versteinen, uh, you guys have labeled this disorder, the zombie disorder, as consciousness deficit hypoactivity disorder. Um, <laughs> explain that a bit and, uh, you know, how does, how does that help us survive the zombie apocalypse? So there's actually a couple of parts. So Steve Schlossman, who's a Harvard psychiatrist, mm -hmm. uh, he had been doing a little bit of like the zombie brain stuff too. Uh, before us. He's also on the Zombie Research Society. And so Tim and I came up with CDHD, uh, the Consciousness Deficit Hypoactivity Disorder, uh, for two reasons. First, Steve has a, uh, has a certain hypothesis about the zombie brain, and so we wanted a competing hypothesis. Uh, and so we gave it a different name. Uh, and secondly, obviously, the, the acronym I already said is CDHD. Uh, it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek poke at ADHD and yeah, yeah. the weird uh, tendency in psychiatry and neuroscience to give overly compl complex names to things we don't really understand. Sounds like engineering. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, part of the reason that we're doing this, Tim and I, is uh, to kind of make fun of our field, our cognitive neuroscience, because a lot of the, uh, a lot of the studies that get popular press are logically very strange, and so we thought it would be really funny if we could uh, use the methods of modern cognero to... to come to logical conclusions of a zombie brain uh, just as e easily as you could any other kind of study. So, <laughs> Sure. That, sure. That's part of the thing. Add a little bit of rationale to the madness. <laughs> so what, are, what were the symptoms you guys uh, highlighted and uh, like what parts of the brain affect that? Oh, man. So I think, I think in the end we, uh, we did, oh, man, is it nine different symptoms? <laughs> awesome. Um, and that's actually expanded even more. Uh, but we have, like, the really obvious stuff uh, is the motor control issues, right? Like, you look at a zombie, and they're not walking correctly. They're really slow and shambling, um, it, at least in the classic Romero zombie sense, uh, the Night of Living Dead type zombies, mm -hmm. uh, the slow zombies. Of course, then you have, like, 28 Days Later and more modern films, which have the fast zombies. So we ended up having to uh, split CDHD into two different subtypes, the fast and slow subtype. <laughs> Um, 
at this year's Society for Neuroscience Conference, which is the big annual international neuroscience scientific conference of like 35,000 people, uh, we put up a, what we're calling a gorilla science poster, mm-hmm. which is just find a spot where there's not a poster hanging up and hang up our zombie poster, oh. try to explain the differences between fast versus slow zombie subtypes and what the neural differences is, what the neural differences are. Um, wow. and that was amusing. We got a lot of really good feedback. We had, uh, uh, tons of people leave comments on the poster cause we just hung it up and left. Um, <laughs> And uh, when I was sitting there at one point, uh, the security guard, wor- uh, one of the security guards working at the convention center was stopping in front of the poster and reading through it. And I thought it was awesome. I'm like, we have got 10,000 posters at this conference. and I've never seen any of the staff that work at this yep. thing yep. actually read one of these. And we had the security guard uh, going over it and sort of smiling and nodding his head. And I thought that was awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> that is definitely awesome. I mean, I remember when I was at SFN and just looking around it's like it's like overload sensory overload so that anybody would be able to just pick one out you know of the entire crowd and actually stand there and look at it instead of planning the itinerary yeah is, uh, is <laughs> <laughs> awesome very cool word but, got out i think uh we had people asking us if we uh if we had any positions open in our lab <laughs> oh wow oh my that's uh, great it was really funny. People people seem to have been super into it, uh, which is again part of the reason that we're doing this. Right, we're trying to trying to do a little bit of outreach, uh, both within and uh, outside of our scientific community. Sure. Now, how how did the uh, how did the neuroscience like community approach the poster? Like, what kind of comments did you guys end up getting? Uh, oh man, I wish I had the actual thing with me. But like I said, so somebody asked if we had any positions open in our lab. Mm-hmm. Uh, somebody said that this is like the best poster they've ever seen at SFM ever. <laughs> um, tons of people left their email addresses to get a PDF copy of the poster. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had, well, I guess this isn't poster specific, but we've definitely had people um, take our nine part uh, zombie brain outline. Mm-hmm. Uh, and use that in uh, teaching. So we have a friend who is uh, finishing her PhD at UC San Diego right now. And uh, she she does a lot of outreach in high school. And she printed out each of the nine symptoms that we came up with for the zombie brain uh, and uh, some of the pictures and stuff we'd put together and went to a high school classroom and had uh, the, the, the classroom break up into nine separate groups and study each of their zombie brain parts and act oh. out the different deficits and things like that. And uh, she was saying that she's never seen any students be as into it uh, as as they were. Like they had like people gnawing on each other and stuff like, <laughs> just, like really like enjoying themselves in in neuroscience, right? Which is kind of cool. So right now, yeah. did you guys base this off of like real life examples, or was it kind of an exaggeration of real life examples? How did that work out? Um, well, it's definitely a mix of the two. I would say. Uh, we 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 treated it as though uh, the movies were uh, accurate portrayals of the behavior of these of the zombie, right? So sure. that's that's what you have to start with, and then you say, okay, if if these behaviors are like this, what do we know about the brain that would cause a behavior that looks like this, right? So like, what would cause this really slow, stiff movements, um, uncoordinated? What would cause insatiable hunger? What would cause uh, you know flesh addiction or something like that? And so, you know, it's a way to talk about uh, really complex things like addiction, uh, which we know a little bit about, but not a whole lot about the neurobiology of addiction. Mm-hmm. But we sort of take that model and try and extend it a little bit. Um, you know, language deficits, uh, uh, imperviousness to pain. You know, we know a lot about the neural systems involved in this stuff uh, at a very gross level. Mm-hmm. So we just sort of ran with that. And, well, you know, a lot of what we know in, in uh, terms of, uh, what brain areas are required to do what kinds of things? Uh, we know from looking at people with very specific types of brain damage. So, you know, the reason that we know that um, the left frontal lobe is involved in uh, speech aspects, uh, the motor aspects of speech, is because of people who've had a stroke mm-hmm. damaging those brain areas that can no longer speak, right? Mm-hmm. And that was actually one of the trickier parts of this, which is. Um, because we're talking about, you know, the zombie brain as though there's brain damage to all these different brain regions, we don't want people who actually had a stroke or something like that to come and say, 
oh, so are we a zombie now, right? Like there's a sort of <laughs> delicate sensitivity issue sure, here. Sure. Uh, in my PhD, I worked with a lot of people with uh, frontal lobe damage. That was my, that was my PhD thesis. Mm. Um, and looking at how people recover from that. And so, you know, it's something I take very seriously in my day job, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I was initially really concerned that people would think that this was just, you know, horrible and rude and making fun of people with stroke. And that's not the, uh, you know, not the message I wanted to get across at all, but it was definitely a concern when we first started doing this. We we're actually really worried about it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't seem to have been a problem. Everybody seems to understand that it's all tongue in cheek and really fun and things like that. But that, that concern was there. Sure, sure. It's so, one thing that comes up quite a bit on this show, actually, is that uh, one of the most interesting things uh, from, uh, I guess, the more learned uh, direction of looking at zombies is how damn useful the metaphor can be. Yeah. Hmm. So what other, what other systems have you guys, like, uh, in your show, like, what are some of your favorite, uh, like, you know, metaphor, zombie metaphors that work in real life? Uh, Wait, interview, most you. of the time it's, uh, it's more related to how to be prepared to be able to function, uh, in a situation where the, the safety net of society is very quickly gone. Mm-hmm. Right. And, uh, which technologies are most important to focus on for rebuilding things back up to the point where we can get back to business. So we talk to a lot of engineers who, you know, talk about maybe water for water purification. Well, how do you purify water? Well, you could use ozone off a Tesla coil, you know, <laughs> and do that. And actually, one of the people that we interviewed did that, um, you know, in, in the survival show on Discovery. And uh, other things like, I think, uh, well, disaster preparedness, for instance. You know, uh, one of the people that we interviewed said, you know, it's it's... She So she walks home uh, from her office, and people ask her sometimes why she walks home. Well, you can say the very sobering reason of it's so that if in the case of an earthquake, I can get home without relying on public transportation, or it's to survive the zombie apocalypse. You know, <laughs> right? Which one is going to be more, oh, ha, 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 that's funny. Um, it's going to be the zombie apocalypse. And so it's a really good metaphor to talk about serious topics like this even with like aphasia or um you know difficulty walking or um like bradykinesia it's you can say it in the zombies with that with a little chuckle with zombies with a little chuckle it as opposed to oh my my mother had a stroke you know this is what happened blah 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 yeah, I mean, it's definitely a little bit weird for me to be doing uh, some of this stuff because I grew up with my uh, my step grandfather, mm-hmm. and he had he had Parkinson's disease. And so, you know, you mentioned bradykinesia, and that's one of the symptoms we talk about uh, is uh, in, in the zombie brain. We we say that the basal ganglia are are disrupted, the function of the basal ganglia, and people with Parkinson's disease. Um, that, I mean, that's what we based it on is they have what, yeah, like you said, bradykinesia, which literally means, uh, I think, slowing of movements. I think mm-hmm. brady is slowing. Um, and it's a very common thing. And so it was kind of weird, you know, growing up in, with my grandfather and, you know, seeing him do these kinds of things. And then we're like, ha, 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 zombies are doing this too, right? Like, you know, there's definitely that personal aspect where you're like, got to gotta walk that line very carefully, like I said earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, you, you've used the words bradykinesia and aphasia. Uh, I've been avoiding using technical jargon. No, you know what? If, Use as much as you uh, want. The okay. audience on this show is just as nerdy as us three, so you know, <laughs> go for it. Yeah. All right, so I'll try not to try not to hold back. Uh, you know, a lot of lectures and stuff I do are for very mixed crowds, and of course, very nerdy crowds too. But uh, so I, I've tried to avoid jargon as best I can. No, but go it, for, it. Yeah. for it. I'm, 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 we have a strict policy around here. It's like, if you don't understand something, go look it up. I mean, that's kind of the point, right? <laughs> awesome. It's an I educational agree. program at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I could talk a little bit more about, you know, I, I could outline the nine different symptoms that we've, we've talked about, right? Sure. Uh, uh, and we can, talk, we can touch on any of those if you guys want. So the nine different symptoms that we, we've outlined give us five survival tips. Uh, that we could try and really uh, 
uh, figure out. So the first one is uh, impulsive reactive aggression, which in the neuroscience literature and psychology literature is very very specific type of aggressive behavior. Um, and uh, so it, it's more of like a, uh, a, a almost a response to um, like a violent pathological violence. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, it's very different from other ki- other kinds of aggression. Um, the second one is, uh, I already mentioned, we've talked about several times, is the lumbering walk, right? The bradykinesia. Yeah. Um, then there's long-term memory loss, which you can see in a lot of movies. I think uh, Land of the Dead and Shaun of the Dead did a really good treatment of uh, the long-term memory loss, but the intact hab- like habits. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you remember, there's a scene in Land of the Dead where uh, uh, they're walking up to a gas station and I think a zombie steps on um, the air pressure gauge that causes the bell to ring and big daddy, who's like one of the zombies walks out and grabs the gas pump and sort of looks around. Um, (laughs) and then of course at the end of Shaun of the dead, you know, uh, they're sitting in the shack in the backyard playing video games together. Uh, Sean with, with his, you know, with his zombified buddy. Um, so that was symptom three. We talked about language deficits a little bit too, right? Zombies aren't normally saying much of anything. Actually, although in night of the living dead, uh, one of the zombies does actually get on the cop radio and requests them to send more cops. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we, there's another one that we, we were really like kind of happy with this one. We're trying to explain why in some zombie movies, uh, if you walk like a zombie and act like a zombie, they don't attack you. Um, and there's something called the self other delusion, uh, 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 also known as the Capgras delusion in the neuroscientific literature. So mm-hmm. That's another thing that zombies have. Uh, pain, lack of pain, right? Um, they seem to be able to perceive, but they don't really react to any kind of painful stimulus. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing that we, uh, that we call generally neuroscience stimulus-locked attention, uh, where they're very easily distracted. So I don't know if you've ever played Left 4 Dead, but you throw the, uh, yep. the you know, beeping grenade and yep. they all go running after it. Um, <laughs> Also, in Land of the Dead, they set off fireworks and all the zombies sort of stare up in the sky and look at them. Uh, then there's flesh addiction or, or you know, insatiable hunger. Mm-hmm. Um, and those are the last two. Okay. So, yeah, there's like the nine big symptoms. And, you know, I don't know if we have enough time to go into like all of the details about every single one. But normally we would. But uh, considering what uh, you are an expert in and considering what I'm trying to do, uh, as a hobby, I think I'm probably going to steal part of the interview to uh, <laughs> drill you about uh, uh, neuroscience because I like working with uh, artificial life, artificial intelligence, neural networks, and that sort of thing. And I, there's some questions that I might have, and uh, yeah, so <laughs> so we can then we can go into just what does this mean for us, knowing what we know about uh, exhibited symptoms. <laughs> So how can we use this information? Yep. Basically. Yeah. So that, that was, that was like the last thing that we wanted to do, right? We're like, okay, we've come up with all these symptoms. So what, right? Uh, what can we do now that we know all this stuff? And so we came up with these like five survival tips. Um, uh, the first one being there, if they're slow, you can just outrun them. Uh, <laughs> and I think they did this several times in, um, Dawn of the Dead in the shopping mall where they were just like yep. running around and avoiding them and hitting them and stuff like that. Uh, the other one is because they have amnesia, if you can, if you can, uh, just kind of keep quiet and wait it out, they might forget that you were there, mm-hmm. um, which kind of relates to the other one, which is they're easily distracted. So if you can distract them and hide even better, uh, cause they'll, they'll, their attention will totally get, uh, pulled away and then they have a high probability of forgetting that you were even there. Well, that's why uh, the screaming girls always get killed. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Silliness. Yeah. Which always makes for really cool uh, cinematic moments, right? Where they're like somebody, you know, it's obviously terrifying and, and somebody's whimpering and somebody else is trying to keep them quiet and holding <laughs> their mouth or something. Uh, it makes for really good tense cinematic moments. Yep. Um, and then, of course, their, their immunity to pain means that, you know, unless you can take them out, there's no point in fighting them. It's not like you can, you know, incapacitate them uh, because they're, just they're come so crawling cool. to you. Right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, which is another thing, you know, this isn't, in our, this isn't one of our neuroscience tips, but this is just like a general 
I've always wondered why they don't do, do this in movies, uh, which is, I don't know why people don't wear leather more. Like, oh. Leather is really hard to bite through. So, like, what you always see is either a zombie crawling on the ground and, like, biting somebody in the ankle mm-hmm. or behind biting them on the shoulder or something like that. And I'm like, you know, if you wore a leather jacket and some leather pants, yep. you would really prevent that from happening. So, so the bikers will survive. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Actually, in, in, again, in uh, Dawn of the Dead, the original one, isn't that what happened? Like a group of bikers came over to the mall and took it over? I think, is that, is that what happened? I'm, I might be misremembering that. But... Yeah, it's been too long. <laughs> it's been a while, yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, the last one is if, if nothing else works, you can always try and mimic them. Mm-hmm. Um, which uh, Walking Dead did really good. Yeah, uh, we saw that where he, I think they surrounded themselves in guts and such. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was pretty heinous. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah. uh, Eddie was showing me a page, and I, I believe uh, you're listed on the same uh, board as Romero for this stuff. Yeah. Zombie Research Society. Gosh, what's that like? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> um, we actually had a chance to meet him at uh, ZombieCon, the first annual ZombieCon last year. Cool. Uh, so every year in Seattle now, for two years in a row anyway, uh, they've had ZombieCon, and Romero was the guest of honor last year. And uh, he was on a couple of panels and doing all these kinds of presentations and stuff like that. And we went to one of them where it was actually supposed to be an hour-long interview with Romero about his take on fast versus slow zombies. Hmm. Except the two people who were doing the interview never ended up showing up. And oh. so the guy running the con came up to me. He's like, hey, dude, can you fill in? <laughs> and so I ended up getting up on stage and oh uh, <laughs> George Romero for an hour. <laughs> uh, shooting the shit, talking about fast versus slow zombies, and it was amazing. I had this like very surreal moment where I'm like, I'm I'm up on stage with the guy who came up with the zombie film back in the '60s, yeah. interviewing him about fast versus slow zombies and zombie brains. How the hell did I find myself in this position? Uh, I feel like that about once a week. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was amazing. It was it was so rad. And there was an after party. Uh, the next night, and he actually came up to me and he was like, "Hey, science guy, how's it going?" And I was like, "Are That's you kidding cool. me? I don't care if you don't remember my name. It's rad that you recognize me." It's <laughs> <laughs> great. That is that is really cool. It would be really fun to get him on this show sometime. I'm sure people would get a kick out of that. Well, George freaking Romero. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now I've got an interesting observation here. We've been doing this show for a little while now, but there seems to be a really uh, heavy, uh, uh, how would you say, uh, leaning towards the San Francisco area for guests. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've had Mark Van De Wettering from Pixar. We've had uh, Joe Grand uh, from Grand Idea Studios and Prototype This, I guess the that's TV true. show. We've had uh, 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 Mira Grant. Yeah, she's in the Bay Shan- Area. McGuire, who is also in San Francisco, she's the author of Feed. Not- okay. Uh, um, uh, pretty sure there, there might be another one in there, but this at least makes four. Uh, I'm, I'm starting to think you guys ought to like get together and make your own little like hacker space for zombie survivalists or something. <laughs> there was actually a, uh, so Mira, uh, was at an event with me uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, there is the San Francisco, uh, the, sorry, the Bay area science festival. Uh, being organized by UC San Francisco. And it was just like week-long ev- event. And um, the California Academy of Sciences, uh, which is in Golden Gate Park, it's, um, it's a museum, they sort of kicked off the event by ho- hosting a uh, zombie nightlife. <laughs> so on Thursday nights, they usually do this thing where they uh, close the museum to anyone under 20 uh, only for people 21 and up and they have a bunch of bars open and everything like that. And it's sort of like a, uh, it's almost like a nightclub. It's crazy. Um, and it was all zombie themed. And so I gave That's a talk there cool. or was there and there was like a, yeah, there's like a huge Bay area zombie thing going on. I mean, uh, the zombie con is held in Seattle every year. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I think they currently hold the world record still for the like biggest zombie walk. So Seattle definitely <laughs> wants to claim, that they're the zombie capital, sure. um, but I think San Francisco could give them a run for their money. Sure. <laughs> well, the experts seem to be living in San Francisco, so that's cool. I wonder what that is. Yeah, that's pretty wild. <laughs> so did you get to meet her? Or? No, we actually, uh, we, I don't think we really got a chance to meet. I think we very briefly maybe shook hands or something like that, but uh, uh, 
we definitely are um, the the person that organized it uh, was trying to get us to to get together and uh, I've been trying to do that but uh, like I said earlier I've got a 11 week old uh, first child right now so it's a little bit hard to get out and do much of uh, anything (laughs) (laughs) congratulations something to look forward to uh, uh, get her going on a uh, a virology rant and you'll have a good time I promise oh yeah (laughs) <laughs> so um so the zombie brain stuff is is kind of a side hobby project which has kind of become this huge thing um for you but what do you study normally so the very broad uh way of putting what i study is uh i try and figure out how different brain areas communicate to give rise to cognition uh that's really broad and so um, I use a couple of different methods to get at that. One is by looking at people with, like I said earlier, focal brain damage. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, if you have um, a series of connected networks and a node goes down, how does information re- reroute? Um, and so one of the things I'm really interested in is uh, if you have a stroke in your motor cortex, for example, you're pretty much paralyzed. Uh, if you have a stroke in your visual cortex, you're pretty much blind. Um, if you have a stroke in your prefrontal cortex, uh, which is one of the reasons that regions of the brain that I'm very interested in, uh, that controls, uh, it's, it's executive functioning. So like higher cognition, attention, memory, things like that, Mm -hmm. working memory, I should say. Um, if you have a stroke, massive stroke to that brain area, it's not like you're no longer attentive. Uh, it's not like you don't have working memory. It's just, you're a little bit worse at it. Uh, why is that? And so that was, that was what I did my PhD on, Mm -hmm. um, And I also do work with people who have uh, electrodes implanted uh, actually into their brains. So people who have uh, intractable epilepsy, so epilepsy and seizures that uh, aren't treatable by uh, really any other method like uh, medications, um, they can go in for uh, brain surgery to actually remove the epileptic focus, the the part of the brain that's causing the seizures. Right. Um, And the surgeons will implant electrodes actually onto their brains to try and localize uh, the seizure focus. And while they've got these electrodes implanted for about a week, um, we ask them if they'd, if they'd like to take part in some of our research projects. And usually they're just sitting in their hospital room with these wires coming out of their head for a week. And so they're suits just ridiculously bored, obviously very uncomfortable. Right. Um, right. and it's a difficult situation for them, but they're usually happy to do it. And so, uh, that's getting a little bit at like, um, how do, uh, brain oscillations, uh, affect cognition. And so I do some research. Uh, my next project uh, at UCSF, where I just started my postdoc, it, the first project I'm doing is probably going to be looking at, uh, can we uh, get some real-time information about uh, somebody's current sort of quote-unquote brain state? What what brain wave state are they currently in? Mm-hmm. And use that to ap- actually manipulate their attention, given what we know about the physiology of these brain waves. So, so like just directly analyzing EEGs. So using, using scalp EEG in, in normal healthy people uh, to read your like oscillatory state in real time to then present you a stimulus uh, at a either opportune or inopportune attentive state moment to see if we can sort of push around your ability to uh, pay attention to things. Huh. Um, and that's based on some of the sort of more physiological work I did with these patients who had these implanted electrodes. Sure. So. Now, the um, wiring and such and the rewiring, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that's neuronal plasticity? Exactly. Yeah, neuroplasticity or neuronal plasticity, yeah. Okay. And I was just wondering, on a side note, how likely would it, like, do we have methods for um, helping with that rewiring? Or, like, are there, is there a possibility that we'll come up with something that'll help increase or make more efficient plasticity? So, I mean, there's still, okay, that's a complex question. First, there's, uh, I've done a little bit of research on brain-computer interfaces uh, mm-hmm. as well, and uh, there's sort of a little bit of a, a friendly bet I have going on with some people who do cell molecular uh, neuroscience who are, you know, working on like stem cell regeneration therapy and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so brain-computer interfaces, one of the things that we're trying to do is, you know, if you have a stroke that damages your, your motor cortex and paralyzes you, uh, can we just read out 
your your desire to make a certain kind of movement and then instantiate that in some sort of robotic device, right? So that would be one way of getting around the paralysis is by reading your brain state and then using that to control an external device, right? right. The other one is using you know stem cell therapy or something like that to just rewire the uh, the lost connections or whatever. Um, and so you know there's like a little bit of a friendly bet of which one's going to win out first. Um, I think in the end. Uh, both of these technologies and, and things will end up uh, working in the long run. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, obviously, uh, the, for the patients, it doesn't matter which one happens first. As long it, as it works. Come along. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but uh, a friend of mine actually just had a, a paper in Nature uh, last month looking at uh, what he calls functional neurogenesis. So he showed in rats that um, neurogenesis actually has behavioral uh, relevance. So, like, the creation of new neurons actually does affect... Um, cog- cog- like certain behavioral states, um, and so that was uh, that was a major paper because it was one of the first times showing that neurogenesis is actually uh, the creation of new neurons actually does happen and affects behavior. Right. Um, the rewiring, really big. yeah, the rewiring stuff is a little bit different because it's like creation of new pathways between existing neurons, right? So it's mm-hmm. not really creating new neurons; it's it's sort of um, taking over existing pathways to make them new, do new things, uh, which was what uh, my PhD thesis was a little bit more focused on. Um, you know, I, I, I do research on humans using uh, EEG, mm-hmm. and so we can't look at actual any kind of rewiring or things like that, but you can try and infer it based upon uh, what we thought were some pretty clever, clever uh, <laughs> behavioral designs and application of EEG. Sure. Sure. Now, uh, I've seen uh, some talks that you've given in the past, and uh, you do a sort of uh, uh, demonstration of how much a human brain can fill in once it knows what information to expect, and ah. you use audio for your example by removing most of the information out of a recording, playing it for the audience, and uh, letting it sink in that they can't understand it, playing them the un- uh, affected copy and then playing it for them a second time and then they can easily uh, hear it uh, yeah. and I found it very interesting that uh, when you played the the sample the first time I was very easily able to hear it uh, but then I thought about it and I'm like I do audio work and I must have developed uh, neural pathways just to be able to because I do so much intensive listening all of the time I must have just developed uh, extra uh, handling capabilities for that sort of thing to be able to pick out little uh, bits of information and rebuild it on the fly. I would love to pick your brain. <laughs> <laughs> literally? So, um, so I'm actually very fascinated by uh, these sort of edge cases. So uh, so stepping, stepping away a little bit, uh, in the last couple of years, I've gotten really interested in the role that data plays in, in the scientific process. Um, we have so much data in the neurosciences, uh, but you know, we have a really hard time integrating all of this information into some sort of coherent theory. Mm-hmm. And so I've been getting a lot more into like data mining and, and things like that. Um, and I've been working with this data set from this company in San Francisco, uh, and they do online brain training and they've got like hundreds of thousands of users that have done this cognitive task. And I've been sort of mining through that to see, uh, like, different learning patterns in, in people and things like that. And what you're talking about is one of the things I'm fascinated about, which is like what I would call like expert performance, right? So if you think about general performance of the population as being a bell curve, right? Um, where, you know, 5% of the population uh, you would consider to be like really amazingly excellent performers and 5% really terrible performers, but like 68% of the population is pretty normal um, and like average, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what is it about these sort of edge cases, these like super performers that makes them do so well, right? And past performance would be one of those kinds of, uh, uh, effectors. So, uh, I have a buddy who, uh, does some work in film and, uh, I can't remember exactly the, uh, the title of it, but like the job, but they, they watch film at like three times the normal speed when movies are going through production um, to look at the color balance um, from like frame to frame huh. and like their ability to take in visual information is just incredible like they can spot one frame 
uh, when they're going like 90 frames per second or something like that, right? Like ridiculously fast. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they can spot like a single frames that are out of color balance or something like that. Um, and, you know, Whisker, you're talking about doing, you know, tons and tons of auditory work. So you're very used to, to pulling signal out of noise in, in you know, the audit, auditory system, um, auditory stimuli, I should say. And so you've got a lot of practice. And so there's actually a couple of researchers, <laughs> I'm totally rambling here, but there's a couple no, of researchers that, uh, in UCSF in uh, Berkeley who study in rats uh, the development of the auditory system. So Mike Merzenich and uh, Shawan Bao and his, his grad students and stuff. Hmm. And they showed that um, um, if you raise rats in an environment with a lot of, uh, like, an overrepresentation of a single frequency, then... The frequency maps of our auditory cortex, the auditory cortex is, uh, uh, develops in what's called a tonotopic manner. So uh, frequencies are, are like 5 kilohertz tones, kilohertz tones will be represented in one blob of cortex. And right next to it, you'll have 7 kilohertz. And then next to it, you have you know, mm -hmm. 10 kilohertz and so on. There's like a, a, a clear map of frequency representation in the auditory cortex. And if you actually play overrepresent statistically one, one frequency, in development, then that part of their auditory cortex that represents that frequency will be huge um, relative to the rest and relative to normal. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of research on what are the behavioral consequences of this, right? And uh, there's one of the one of the grad students in this guy, Shaolin Bao's up at Berkeley, uh, is Korean, and she was kind of interested in uh, um, developmental phonemes. And so uh, there's like in Chinese, there's certain uh, tones and phonemes that English users, English speakers, native English speakers just cannot hear the difference, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the flip side, uh, in Korean and Japanese, they, they lack a different differentiation between the R and L phonemes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We're very so, familiar with this, Eddie's uh, uh, Chinese, Chinese descent, and <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not. And when she gets mad and she says all these words really fast... I can't understand, and, <laughs> and she tries to explain to me how to pronounce some of the stuff, and it just, sometimes it just won't work. She just looks at me like I'm a three-year-old. So you actually have a, a, a neurobiological excuse. You literally cannot hear the difference. Yep. yep. <laughs> um, and so she's doing research on, on rats and like these frequency and tonal environment changes uh, during development uh, to show, to try and make the, the, the leap that like this is why, uh, you know, uh, Japanese speakers can't hear the difference between R's and L's, and why English speakers can't hear the difference between some of these Chinese phonemes. Um, it's just, you know, but, and actually there's been research done on, uh, uh, you know, human babies that show that up until, like, I forget what the age is, like six months or a year, uh, babies can tell the difference, regardless of their native mm -hmm. language environment. Um, but, you know, once, once they sort of get weaned off of hearing the difference because their environment doesn't have that difference represented, um, therefore their brain doesn't need to represent the difference anymore and therefore they can't actually perceive the differences anymore. And there's a short-term version of this that everyone that, that does mastering uh, and mixing, uh, final mixes of songs and podcasts and such like I do, is aware of. And uh, uh, oh, there's, a, there's a name that we use for it, but I can't remember it just this moment. But the, the basic effect is, is that when you're mixing a song, you you do the the majority of the work but then you go away and you have to go away for like 12 hours or so before you can come back and do the final mastering work because if you've been sitting there for 6 hours listening to something there are aspects of it that your uh auditory processing centers just have tuned out and you won't hear them anymore you go away for 12 hours, you come back, you listen to it again, you're like, oh, man, I can't believe I missed that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm totally spitballing here. I don't even know if anybody's done any research on this, but I would, uh, I, I get this in writing, right? I do a lot of writing for, for oh. you know, my research. Yep. Mira oh, talked first. about that just the other day, yep. you know, and I yeah. think it's not just audio. It's not just, you know, writing. It's all things, you know, our brain just is good at tuning out the noise. Yeah, you have a um, you, you spend so much time with with either the, the the you know auditory sample that you're mastering or the paper that you're writing, mm -hmm. and it has a certain uh, sound or feel or flow in your head that you've you've crystallized. And regardless of whether or not the real thing matches that, it doesn't matter because you you know you're going to fill it in the way that you perceive it. 
Um, and you have to go away from it for a while. I, I get this all the time. I'll come back. Um, so I, I do some blogging, right? And I'll, I'll write a blog post and I'll read through it several times and be like, okay, it's good. And then I'll post it, come back the next day and be like, crap, how did I miss all of these like, typos? Right? It's like you have it so clear in your head, but you know, you just easily miss over, miss it. Actually, Whisker, if you want, I can, um, after this, I can send you the, uh, MP3 or my wave format files of the, uh, the auditory samples that I do in that talk. If oh, you want to cool. play it as an example during the podcast. Yeah. That'd be cool. I might be able to squeeze those in there. Cause I remember when I first listened to it, I was like, Whoa, I really <laughs> can't unhear that. crap." <laughs> All right. Now I normally don't do this, but I, uh, don't often get to talk to somebody who specifically is, uh, an expert on something that I really need a good answer to. Uh, okay. So I'm going to actually hijack the podcast here for a couple minutes. You know, it's my podcast. I'll hijack it if I want. Um, <laughs> you kids get off my lawn. So um, I've been working with neural networks for, oh gosh, probably like 10, 7 years, somewhere in there. Uh, and I've made lots of little steps forward. Uh, I don't do uh, like the mathematical feedback training sort of things. I stick completely to natural selection uh, sorts of training. Uh, so uh, large groups of the neural networks will be competing in an environment, and that environment is the data set that they're trying to learn. Right. So uh, I'm training behavior generationally over time instead of trying to use some math tricks to do it. And I base it completely around the connectome, not any sort of uh, algorithmatic tricks, okay? Okay. So this is very much more based on biology than mathematical uh, trickery. Now, uh, one thing that I'd like to do with these is to add the ability for memetics to play a role so that there can be uh, horizontal learning, not just vertical learning. Does right. that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So... What I'm really fascinated with at the moment is uh, I, I'm i not the expert, you are obviously, but I think I've heard it said that it's the neocortex that's sort of responsible for the the mind's ability to connect concepts together into chains. Is that accurate? Uh, as best as we can tell, I think that's, that's, that's as good of an uh, accurate as you're going to get, yeah. Okay. Now, the, the literal biology of it's not important because obviously they're evolving their own biology. As they develop their own biology, they're going to come up with their own ways to do this, and I can observe them doing it when it happens, and I know what to look for to find that out. But um, I'm really, really interested in how much you think memetics and horizontal uh, learning plays a part in us as a species because you take snapshots of us at different periods of time and it seems to me like our evolution has pretty much kind of stopped and it has crossed over into a virtualized evolution that happens more in the in the the software rather than the hardware so um I used to think the same thing about like evolution has stopped uh, in humans, right? Like we can sort of using our cognition, we've subverted the the natural selection process, uh, right? Um, is is how I I used to conceive of it. Uh, turns out that might not actually be true, but nevertheless, if we if we sort of run with that and say that natural selection is no longer the major driving force, right, of our evolution, um, uh, our cognition plays a more important role. And the, the willful decisions that we make uh, can subvert that process. Um, and therefore, if that is the case, uh, obviously society uh, becomes a very important aspect of that, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, so given that premise, I don't, I mean, I don't think there's any way I could argue, argue with you, right? Like, like uh, memetics or society or culture or whatever you want to call it. Um, really do shape us in a lot of ways, right? Actually, there's some really cool research going back to neuroplasticity, um, still arguing, like the safer warf hypothesis of does our language affect our cognition and our perception? Yeah, that's the next right? thing that I was going to get to right there, was that what I'm like dancing around right now is figuring out 
at what point do I stop trying to build in uh, uh, the evolutions that allow for communication so that they can share ideas with one another and just like sort of slow down the biological evolution and let the 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 cognitive cultural mimetic evolution take over i'm trying to find that boundary point so that i can sort of let it you know the biology bootstraps it and then from there just let it go yeah that's really tough so <clears throat> I'm not really an expert in uh, like neural networks or, or anything like that, right? Um, in in the sense of creating artificial neural networks, um, but um, as a neuroscientist, I feel like I, I I have to be knowledgeable about these things, or else I'm going to be left behind, right? Because it's part of what we probably a very important part of who we are and how our brain works. Um, so I've I've done some reading on this stuff, and one thing that I'm really fascinated by is uh, if you have any any network of coupled oscillators. So, uh, you know, if you connect any kind of, sorry, I shouldn't say any network, almost any network of coupled oscillators where you have, you know, a bunch of things that like are, ne are connected to their neighbors in some way and they have these on and off signals uh, occurring, then you get these like macro scale patterns of information flow uh, within this network where you get like with these waves of information that propagate around, right? Um, and I know that people have certainly used that kind of uh, thing as like a metaphor for, for cultural transmission of information, right? Um, but what you're getting at right now is uh, really the stuff I find the most fascinating because it's the most complex, right? It's like, how do you, so I'm going to, I'm going to totally zoom out here and get on my like neuroscience is awesome soapbox, uh, <laughs> you know, because what we're really trying to do is we're trying to bridge like cell molecular biology, right? Like how do ion channels and neurons work with, uh, you know, these, these neural network concepts of how does, how does information flow through connected, uh, networks, uh, which is like really a computer engineering problem in a lot of ways, right? And a computer science problem hmm. to how does that give rise to cognition, uh, which then obviously touches on like psychology and things like that. And then you start getting into like, well, then how does that affect societies, right? And you get into sociology. And so it's like you're, you're you know, using these really complex mathematical techniques to analyze data um, that you're collecting using a wide variety of tools uh, that involve molecular biology and psychology and, you know, computer science, computer engineering and, and sociology and psychiatry and psychology. And it's like this is this is like my my soapbox rant that I get on all the time, which is no, no one person can ever do this, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I do not expect that any any one person or research group in the next 30 years will ever come out with like a unifying theory of anything in, in neuroscience. It's going to be this like really complex web and and I, I of information that we need to somehow integrate, and uh, you need a ton of different specialists in order to do that. And you know, right now you still have groups of cognitive neuroscientists that are all doing fMRI together. Um, and they may not even know how their fMRI machines work. They probably don't know the physics of it. It doesn't matter because they get the pre, you know, pretty picture blobs. Mm -hmm. Then you have other people that are doing you know, ion channel work in, in neurons. Um, and you know, they don't really care what animal the neurons in necessarily or anything like that. They just want to know what causes you know, action potentials to happen and how the ion channel opens and closes in response to a neurotransmitter. Uh, right? And it's like all of these people but we're all working on the same problem. And you go to the Society for Neuroscience conference that we were talking about earlier, it's 30,000 people attend every year, at least, right? Um, and I've been going now for nine years, and it's always been about 30,000 people a year. And if you assume that 20,000 of those are neuroscientists, um, which I think is a low number, but like, you know, there's a lot of exhibitors and stuff. So let's say 20,000 are neuroscientists. And let's say they only work 50 hours a week for 300 days a year, which is totally not true because as a grad student, you work like 80 hours a week. Right. You're talking about, what is that, 30,000 times um, 50 times 300. I mean, you're talking about like, what, 10 million man hours and women hours a year on this problem, right? right. Um, every year for nine years that I've been doing this. You're talking about like hundreds of millions of man hours probably over the course of the nine years that I've been working on this. And, you know, you go to this conference now in 2011, and the stuff that I see is kind of a lot like the stuff I saw in 2003 with, like, a couple of big methodological breakthroughs, right? And you're like, okay, well, we've got cooler new toys and new methods, but 
do we have any more of a deeper understanding about how the brain works? Hmm. Not, not really. It's like, you know, fitting another puzzle piece here and there. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, it's amazing to me. And so. I think uh, that's, I think that's very interesting because, so I told you earlier, I used to do behavioral neuroscience research and a lot of the method, methods that we used, gosh, back, I started in what, 2000, I want to say, um, a lot of the methods that I used in 2000 have not changed, you know, for, for testing my mouse models. Right. And even now when I talk with my uh, mentor, my PI from back then, you know, he's always like, yeah, if you guys come up with new techniques that we can try to validate by all means, there's just nothing new. I mean, they're still using the same plastic mazes that they were 10 years ago. Shit, the tea maze they've been using for like... Yeah. 40 years or yeah. 50 or 70 or whatever, right? Yep. Like, yep. um, scalp EEG, which I, you know, I published my PhD on, uh, and got a couple of really high profile papers on, uh, is, uh, nearly a hundred years old. <laughs> <laughs> um, and anytime a new technology like fMRI comes out or in, in, you know, mouse and rat models now, the big thing is optogenetics. Hmm. Um, the first thing that everybody does is scrambles, to run the same studies that people have already done in the previous technology again. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, people have been doing these like language studies using these like very specific cognitive tasks that have been around for decades. Um, you know, and they did those in psychological tests and then people came up with, uh, using EEG in neuroscience. And so they ran all of those tests using EEG and then somebody came up with positron emission tomography or PET and they ran all of those in PET. And then fMRI got invented, and then they ran all those in fMRI. <laughs> they're, busy, uh, they're busy rerunning tests instead of running new ones. <laughs> yeah, and so actually I gave a talk uh, at this uh, electrocorticography meeting uh, mm-hmm. right before the neuroscience conference, which is this inter, like, sub, subdural intracranial electrode placement on the brain, right? Mm-hmm. And that's becoming like a really big thing. More and more people are getting into it. And uh, the guy that ran the conference, his name is uh, Gerwin Schalk. He's a professor at up at Albany. Um, this is how he closed the, the two day session. He's like, look, we, we can do things here that you cannot do, uh, using any other method in human neuroscience. Stop running the same tasks over and over again. Let's try and do something new. And I think that's actually why people are so excited about opto- optogenetics, right? Which is people really are doing new things now, mm-hmm. right? You can actually do things you, you couldn't do before. You don't have to run the same old things over and over again, even though people are, um, the best work is, is, totally novel right. stuff you just couldn't do before. Um, but anyway, that's a really long winded way to get back to whiskers point, which is dude, I don't know, but, uh, uh, it's really a big problem. Right. And, uh, you know, if this is something that you're actually modeling, I think that's awesome that you're even thinking about it. And, uh, in order to answer the question, uh, which I would actually like, you know, even offline to talk to you a little bit more about, uh, because I, I think it's fascinating. Um, you know, we could definitely pull in a couple of people to try and get different perspectives, right? Because I'm not, a, I'm not a uh, evolutionary biologist, right? I'm not a geneticist, um, and I'm not a like neural networks person. But I'm, I, as much as one can say, they dabble in them. I dabble in them a little bit, right? Like I'm knowledgeable about them, but I'm certainly far from an expert. And I think that's one of the problems in neuroscience is uh, you can't just dabble. You need experts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, uh, being in the position that I'm in with it as more of a, a hobbyist who's basically obsessed with the idea of being, you know, seeing how far we can go uh, with uh, the, the problem at this point and uh, finding a solution that actually works with uh, existing technology that we have today, I have to be a jack of all trades, like you were saying, you know, it's I have to know enough uh, sociology, I have to know enough psychology, I have to know enough uh, neuroscience, you know, all of these things, but just the aspects of them that apply to the problem in a very, you know, specific way so that I can make observations and understand if what I'm doing is moving in the right direction or the wrong direction. Yeah. It's, it's really fun. I mean, like I said, it's been more than a decade probably. I've just, you know, been trying to figure out ways to approach it. Because, uh, you know, if you try to... Uh, simulate in, in the electrical and chemical sense a biological brain uh, it requires the fastest supercomputers in the world right now and it can only do it at half or quarter speed Yeah. so it's like that's an excellent tool and when you guys are able to 
put that together to the point where you know it's simulating it accurately, then you guys can work so much faster to solve a lot, a lot of the problems that we have uh, right. with uh, medicine side of things. Because instead of having to deal with uh, so much uh, focus on having to use actual biological brains and poke them and, you know, give them Zoloft if you're Addy, um, you can, you know, simulate them and you can do it a lot faster than you could in the real world. And that's not necessarily going to give you the right answer, but it'll allow you to try a lot of things really, really quickly to bring you closer to the answers that you're looking for for any particular problem. Well, so here, like to quote the Oracle, uh, here's something that like will really twist your noodle, and this always like really gets me when I think about it. Is um, if 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 the brain is reducible to you know material biological processes, which I fully believe it is, um, and you can simulate that accurately in a computer uh, to use for your experimental research, um, what are the ethical implications of that? Can you turn that simulation off? I mean, if you're actually simulating a brain, how is that? than different, different from a person. True. Right? Yeah, um, you're getting so. into the whole, you know, evil demon or brain in the jar or whatever philosophy. <laughs> you you got to be a philosopher to work on what I work on, too. And yeah. you have to approach those ethical questions of, if I achieve what I'm trying to achieve, what does that make me if I flip the power switch off at the end of the day? And, you know, honestly, I take a very detached view of the whole thing. It's like, if I am to achieve, I, I think that would be a good thing because I actually care enough about the results that I would be nice to whatever might wake up in my system that I develop, right? Because I think that you know, so often you hear this conversation about, well, if AI awakens, it's going to decide that humankind is, you know, seriously flawed and needs to be eradicated, or it will be unwilling to compete for resources with us. Right. Uh, and I look at it as there are children who are raised in a situation where they are taught that, you know, it's you know, dog eat dog, and they grow up to, you know, be f you know, ferocious, you know, consumers of everything they can get their hands on. And then there are people who are taught you know, to share their crayons with the other children, and they grow up to be productive, useful members of society. I think AI is the same exact thing. You know, if I need to turn it off at the end of the day, I could just say, hey, I need to turn you off at the end of the day. Is that okay with you? You know, why not ask the cognitive system if it's okay with being shut down for some maintenance? Assuming that you have the... I mean, this is totally hitting into... I mean, I love... The, like, I could, you know... You, you get a couple of beers together, like, with me, and, you know, I would be happy to talk to this all night long, because this is, the, this is like, the edge stuff that I find awesome about the work that we get to do, right, is, like, what are, what does this stuff mean, right? When you actually get down and do it, you know, that my day-to-day -day job is trying to figure out how brain areas work together and everything like that. Ultimately, what you want is a model of that, right? In order to actually, you know, be doing what I think is good science, in order to understand something, you should be able to have a working model of that thing. Right. It's like, you know, uh, astrophysics, right? Like early astronomy, they tried to model the motions of planets and, you know, you didn't really have a good model and things didn't work and it got more and more complex because sometimes the planets appear to travel backwards. Uh, and then, you know, Newton comes along, comes up with a better theory, um, or I guess Copernicus first did the motion of the planets. I'm just totally screwing up my, neuro, uh, my astronomy history here. But anyway, you know, comes up with a better model that models more accurately, and that has an implication then in the real world, right? Um, and in the neurosciences, we do a lot of experimental work, but there's not a lot of theoretical modeling. And so ideally, what we want to do is use the experiments to come up with a, a better model of how the brain works, right? And uh, once you can model it, then what does that mean, right? Like, if you could fully model the whole thing, uh, you know... Mm -hmm. I, I, you're saying that you'd be a benevolent dictator or, I guess, a benevolent uh, deity. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, can you trust everyone will be? And so what are, you know, these are, these are out there ethical implications, but I, I, I think it's awesome. I think these are fascinating uh, questions. And to even be at a place where we can be talking about this stuff as though it's something we have to be worried about is great. Yeah. 
Oh, oh uh, you can worry about it. I'm not going to worry too much about it because it's like I'm going to be God. So yeah, you know, I I yeah, look no. at it like this. You know, <laughs> there's a lot of talk of stuff about the the singularity and whatnot, and that we just simply can't understand the the rate at which they will improve themselves. So you know, it's like we don't have the capability built into us to be able to understand what will happen once they are quicker than we are, and you know. It's just that sort of thing. I don't worry about what will happen if the sun explodes in 10 minutes. And I'm not going to worry about if, you know, the AI are, are going to, you know, use us as batteries or something. <laughs> it's just not important to me. And and in terms of uh, a, a new theory, not with neuroscience, but with AI, I have a, a new theory that I'd like to throw out there into the world. Um... It seems like AI researchers through the years have always sort of tried to come up with more and more complex systems to emulate bio biological or mathematical uh, functions. And I am, after a decade or more of thinking very hard about this and playing with it, I have gone in the opposite direction, a more Buddhist approach. Instead of thinking about it, where is how can we emulate the same thing that uh, biology came up with, I look at it instead as how can we emulate the environment it, that caused biology to evolve that solution uh, and focus on the, the very core, core truths of that, that you have competition, and because of competition, one thing wins over another thing and that's the singular truth of why we exist the way in which we exist because of our environment and many 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 generations so i apply the same singular truth to trying to create an environment that can uh, evolve its own answer to the solution that's perfect for that environment and if I can do that, I get around the problem of technology isn't fast enough, computers can't process enough to emulate whatever, because it'll evolve to do the correct answer for the correct, you know, system that it's running on. It's hard to argue with your premise. I mean, it's not even just the whole organisms, right? It's not like we exist in an environment where, where competition is, is a truth, but I mean, even within our own brains. Uh, neurons compete very early on. Hmm. Right? Um, you're born with so many more neurons than you have later on in life. Um, it's true. And, you lose most of them. And and the losing people think is a bad thing, and oh, it's no. not. You're you're getting rid of you're getting rid of, rid of noisy oscillators. You're getting rid of noisy components in the system. And if they're not doing something useful to maximize your behavioral outcomes, then the neurons get pruned away. Um, and it, you know the, the the mnemonic in neuroscience is use it or lose it, fire together, wire together, right? Like neurons that fire together in uh, uh, in a in a very short temporal period, uh, their synapses are strengthened. Um, so as you know, more behaviorally relevant actions happen in a chain of neurons together, those get strengthened, and the ones that aren't doing something in that network uh, get pruned away. And so, yeah, I mean, it's even within, it, I can't argue with the premise at all. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the, the benefit of thinking about something for a very long time. You tend to be <laughs> rather, uh, you know, you can approach it from a very strong point of view. Uh, but uh, we're running out of time, and Addie has some uh, very specific questions that we like to ask all of the guests just to sort of keep a, a similar vein from show to show. Well, okay, I'm going to ask... A couple of questions that are specific to you, and then I'll ask the typical zombie tech questions. So, um, do you have any plans for analyzing other uh, creatures of the night, such as like vampires and werewolves, or zombies? Kind of where it's at. So, uh, I do have other plans, not necessarily for creatures of the night. <laughs> um, uh, I've actually been thinking about talking about uh, brain-computer interfaces and looking at the history of the representation of brain-computer interfaces uh, in film and literature, okay. compared to like how we are right now. Um, so one example I can give you is like RoboCop, 
right? Yep. Uh, which I freaking love that movie as a kid. And you know how does how does Robocop spring feed interface compare to what, what we actually can do now? Um, we we did we we actually got uh, interviewed by the American Academy of Neurology about our zombie brains, and they ended by asking about. Uh, I think the question was something along the lines of like zombies are so yesterday, um, you know, and vampires are so hot right now. What do you guys think about vampire brains? And I came up with like some B- BS, like off, obviously it's all BS, but like I need more BS off the cuff response. Um, but I don't think that's something I'm really going to like dig into. Sure. Uh, and yeah, zombies I, are totally the new in. <laughs> right, exactly. What, I don't know what she's talking about. Uh, exactly. I was zombie offended. But, like, <laughs> yeah, so uh, we, we definitely have some plans to do other. It, it's become such a great model to teach neuroscience in an interesting way that we, we are, are definitely branching out. Cool. We don't want to be one one trick zombies. Sure, <laughs> one trick neuro neuroscientists. <laughs> Got it. Um, and in different sites, you're labeled as Time Magazine's co-named 2006 <laughs> Person of the Year. Now, how many people actually realize that Time Magazine's 2006 Person is you? Um, like, because I see a lot of sites label that, and I was like, oh, that's really cool. And I looked at, it, I was like. Uh-huh. 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 <laughs> so actually, I, I started doing that a long time ago when I, uh, I was asked to give a, a talk at uh, TEDx Berkeley. Yeah. And we had all of these like really big name people and I'm like, I'm a grad student. <laughs> and so I actually, I threw that in there as like a uh, uh, smart ass, like, you know, look how, look how I'm awesome too. Right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, has anyone called you out on it? <laughs> oh my God, the media organizer from that got really upset with me. Uh, she was like, you know, I almost put that in the uh, in the media pamphlet, saying that we had one of the time persons of the year giving a talk here. And I was like, well, it's technically true. you do, <laughs> but I'm sorry. Um, and so far, other than her, you're the first people that have ever even asked me about it. I've Woo-hoo! actually, I've put this on like official like CV resume stuff for like, job applications. <laughs> Uh, and I've forgotten anybody call me out on it. It's it's just become a one of those like I've been doing it for so long, I'm still amused by it, so I keep doing it. Yeah, you're putting your own it's signal great. out there. You know, you gotta own it. It's, it's definitely one of those like once people realize what it is, it's a grown worthy like oh you jackass. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. I love it. All right, so um, the actual zombie tech questions here. Uh, let's see. What three tools would you bring to a zombie apocalypse bunker? Some kind of blunt weapon, uh, probably a a sword or something that I could easily use. Um, Like, I don't know a lot about swordsmanship, so maybe not even a sword, just like a baseball bat. Something that I could use for, like, self-defense. Okay. Uh, Okay. A a bicycle. And um, probably, like I said, some leather clothes. Cool. Leather coat, clothes work. Actually, we haven't talked about clothing gear, but that's that's a very good start. Sounds like Bradley's a lot more interested in surviving the first couple of days than uh, than focusing on what he's going to do for the next 10 years. <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm hoping that the, uh, the zombies still operate under basic biological premises. And uh, like 28 days later, they eventually just starve. So if I can just hold out for that first like two weeks. Cool. That that's would not, be convenient. <clears throat> and do you have a, a place that you're you're thinking of going to during the zombie apocalypse? Because I'm guessing San Francisco is probably not going to be the place to be. Uh, so I'm totally uh, spilling the beans here. If it ever happens, we're screwed. But my <laughs> wife and I, our zombie contingency plan is to uh, grab a rowboat or sailboat um, and head over to Alcatraz. Ah, so one that of the works. other issues that you always see in zombie films is, you know, you run into a group of other survivors and one of them is secretly bitten but doesn't tell anybody yeah. and in the middle of the night and kill you all. Yeah. Alcatraz works because you can have uh, cells for quarantine. Like, we'll feed you and everything, but, like, if you're a survivor and you come to us, uh, you have to spend a few days in quarantine. Yeah. Hey, that's a smart. That's pretty. Yeah, it's I like that. That's good, yeah. rains enough in San Francisco and it's wet enough that we uh, hope we can make use of the water tower a little bit. Um, so, and if we have to, again, with the rowboat or something like that, uh, you can head over to uh, Oakland, Berkeley, or San Francisco to do some supply raids. Cool. Awesome. Now, we, I, I might request that you bring along an MRI 
you know, just so we can actually do the proper studies on uh, zombies to see uh, how the hypothesis matches with with fact. But uh, uh, I know how to get to Berkeley's. Maybe we can just like uh, it'll be a little bit heavy to carry. So I don't <laughs> robot robot fly, but we'll totally go from, uh, to San Francisco. Can you imagine a <laughs> robot with an MRI machine? Some of those great. some of those Berkeley r- lab rats are half zombies already. <laughs> Four walls. Oh, God. Cool. Well, I guess, I mean, that's, I'm good. All right. Awesome. Well, thank <laughs> cool. you very much for joining us, Bradley. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> is there fun. is there anything that you'd like people to know about, websites or anything? Um, so we, we actually just finished that blog series uh, about the, the different zombie brain symptoms. Um. And so if people want to check that out, you can go to, uh, I guess, my blog. Uh, we've got, like, a video and stuff of the zombie brain, a lot of pictures. And that's just blog.ketyov.com. It's just my last name backwards. So yep. K-E-T-Y-O-V. Okay. Or, okay. Yeah. Awesome. We'll throw a link up in the show description for that. Yep. Uh, well, all you listeners, you can listen to Zombie Tech every week uh, at zombietech.tv. Uh, there's an RSS feed there for uh your phone or itunes or anything like that and it can just automatically show up whenever we put the show up uh this week is actually the first week of a new podcast that we've started for parallax inc Uh, we use their propeller microcontroller all the time Uh, you can check out what we're doing with them over at firstspin.tv our twitter is at tymkrs and uh, Bradley here is on Twitter as well, and I believe Addie has his. Yep, at Bradley Voitek, B-R-A-D-L-E-Y-V-O-Y-T-E-K. You can see him tweeting about how the uh, 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 the drinking has started at various academic events. <laughs> it's quite entertaining. It starts upon touchdown. Basically, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, what? Shout As out. always, you guys can find all our stuff at tymkrs.com. That's it for me, Eddie. Anything else, Bradley? Uh, yeah, I also wanted to do a quick shout out. I forgot for zombieresearch.org. That's the Zombie Research Society website. Cool. Cool. Check it out. We shall. Otherwise, that's it. All right. So thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you guys next week. Bye. <laughs> Later. Bye.